Again, thanks very much for coming. Um, again, thank you, Jeff, very much for being our guest here tonight. Just to give you, I think everyone knows who Jeff is, but I will uh, tell you a few of the uh, impressive things. He's the ninth chairman of GE, uh, and he's held that uh, spot since September 7th of 2011. Uh, he's held global leadership positions at GE since 1982, including roles at GE Plastics, Appliances, and in the healthcare businesses. Uh, in 1989, he became an officer of GE and joined the GE Capital Board in 1997. And in 2000, he was appointed president and CEO. Um, he's been named three times uh, one of the world's best CEOs by Barron's. Uh, and he served as the chair of President Obama's Council on Jobs uh, and Competitiveness. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he earned his Bachelor of Arts at Dartmouth and his MBA from Harvard. So thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Josh. The, uh, the way we're going to um, handle this tonight is uh, there's a few. I'm going to ask uh, questions very briefly, and then Lori uh, and Jeff are going to comment. And we're going to have 10 or 15 minutes at the end uh, for questions from uh, all of you. So if you have any things you uh, want to ask, just think about them, and, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, I was going to start, you know, Lori talked a little bit about what's going on with innovation um, in the opening remarks and how that's going to be part of the symposium. So I thought that that might be a great place to start. And I was hoping, Lori, maybe you could start and comment a little bit on innovation and Dana-Farber and cancer and how that's affecting the future. So Dana-Farber Dana Cancer Institute is all about innovation, and I think one can say that for most major academic medical centers. And uh, you know, I do want to point out that these centers and Dana-Farber are under significant threat because of deficit funding from the government. So, and, and I, have to, I have to say a quote from Barack Obama because I think it's very apt. Cutting the deficit by gutting our investments in innovation and education is like lightening an overloaded airplane by removing its engine. It may make you feel like you're flying high at first, but it won't take long before you feel the impact. So we are all about innovation at Dana-Farber, and this is, I have to say, this is an amazing time for cancer, an amazing time for cancer. I haven't seen a time like this uh, ever in my career as, as a scientist and physician. There are really two revolutions that have taken place, and both of them have taken place at Dana-Farber. And the first revolution was the realization that every patient's tumor is unique, and therefore every patient's therapy should be uniquely designed. So that was called the field of precision or genomic medicine. And faculty at Dana-Farber were really the leaders in that. Uh, faculty like Matthew Meyerson and Bill Hahn and Levi Garraway and others really led the way in making precision medicine a reality by sequencing the tumors of every patient. And we have a program called Profile, which I think is you know, one of the first in the country which has collaborated with other institutions to sequence as many patient tumors as possible so we can find all the genetic mutations that exist out there and figure out which ones should be targeted, which one is the driver mutant gene that is driving that cancer cell. So we've been major innovators in that, and I think we will continue to lead the field in precision medicine. The second revolution occurred just a few years ago, and as an immunologist, um, it was amazing to me, and that was the idea, finally, that bore fruit, that we have an immune system, and our immune system is dedicated to wiping out invaders. We think of those as you know, bacteria or viruses, but they're also tumor cells. Tumor cells should look foreign to your immune system, and most of the time, that happens. So 99% of the time, our immune system kills off random tumor cells. We probably all have rogue tumor cells at one point or another, but it doesn't always work. And so people have asked for over 100 years now, why doesn't the immune system become activated? Why does it miss some of those tumor cells? And you know, this dates back 100 years ago to a, a surgeon in New York City named William Coley, who um, noticed when he operated on some of his patients with cancer and took out the tumor and the wound became infected, 
that some of those patients did really well. And so he thought, well, there must be something in the body that is fighting against the tumor. And he actually developed a, a medicine called Coley's toxins, which was made from bacteria, which he gave to patients. And that worked for a while until it was supplanted by chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And this was a dormant field until, I want to say, 10 years ago. A lot of immunologists tried to figure out how to activate people's immune systems. And the breakthrough came. And I want to say that the breakthrough, one of the major breakthroughs in this field was made at Dana-Farber Cancer Center by one of our faculty, Gordon Freeman, who discovered the key gene that needed to be targeted in order to activate the immune system. So we're all about innovation. And that's what we have to be about, because we are now in a position, I really think, where we can possibly make cancer a chronic disease. Look, we made HIV AIDS a chronic disease, right? And that happened because a lot of funding went into the science, the basic science of that virus and figuring out how to attack it. And the answer was, you've got to attack it with several therapies at the same time, right? And now, uh, you know, a young man who becomes HIV infected now has a normal lifespan. All right, well, cancer is a much more complicated disease than one virus. And so it's going to take us a longer time to figure out how to, how to make cancer a chronic disease. But I do think we're on the cusp of being able to make some cancers chronic diseases. And you know, as I sat there um, on President Joe, Vice President Joe Biden's panel, blue ribbon panel, with a group of, of other, of 28 other uh, scientists to come up with the themes for the Cancer Moonshot, I think we all felt enormously excited at the future and what we could do if we had the resources to do it. We're doing 750 clinical trials right now at Dana-Farber, and we want to do more. We want to do more. So to me, um, you know, I think Dana Farber's like Renaissance Italy or, or Bell Labs, um, Los Alamos. The future is bright for us, but it depends entirely and utterly on continuing to be innovative and take, taking risks, going after what we think is going to be the answer, both in the laboratory and at the bedside of our patients. Jeff, on the commercial side, either in the healthcare business, which you manage, or throughout the commercial enterprise, how do you think about innovation? And especially if you want to comment on how you think about Boston and things like that, which I'm sure is of interest to people. So, well, so Josh, thanks. But uh, it's great to be here with uh, Dana Farm with Lori. So I, I think just from a macro standpoint, whether you're here on uh, the board of this great institution or in a public company or a small company, you know, we sit in a time where the GDP growth in the world is maybe a point and a half lower than it was before the financial crisis. Interest rates are zero, right? And in the US, we have a $19 trillion deficit. So if you're waiting for some kind of magic to take place, no matter where you are, to suddenly give a puff of tailwind, you're going to be waiting a long time. So I think the trick for any institution, whether you're a hospital or a company, is you have to be willing to invest in the face of uncertainty. And we're all in the risk-taking business today. There, there's no uh, certainty. We're all in the risk-taking business. And at the end of the day, you know, innovation is really about picking the right ideas and funding them completely and be, being willing to do them before they're good ideas and be willing to stick with them in good times and bad. And the people that can do that, whether you're in business or whether you're here at Dana-Farber, uh, are gonna be ultimately the people that are, that are successful. So I think innovation has never been more important. Competitiveness and productivity have never been more important because we live in this time period of such great uncertainty. So if I would look at uh, healthcare, we've got a big healthcare business, uh, we're also a big payer, so we, we've been giving employee health care since 1947. We spend about $2.5 billion a year on employee health care. I would piggyback on some of the stuff uh, uh, Lori talked about. I would say I've never seen the pipeline of good ideas as rich as it is today, particularly around uh, cancer and cancer therapy. 
I think the whole notion of precision medicine, seeing diseases more clearly, treating them more effectively is quite impressive. I think the role of, you know, big data is today is everybody's buzzword. But I think if you can use information, machine learning, to stage cancers correctly first time, you can improve survivability, you can improve outcomes dramatically. And then I think Lori's field of cell therapy and uh, immunotherapy uh, is so rich, so worth investing in, uh, that those are three places where Dana-Farber can lead, I think, that are quite fresh as it pertains to what can happen and the kinds of innovations that have to take place. Uh, you know, lastly around Boston, look, um, I had the, um, an amazing office in Connecticut. Huge, <laughs> ornate, awesome, incredible. It was bigger than the first house we lived in, my wife and I, right? <laughs> and when I looked out my window, you know, I'm, I'm traveling most of the time, but when I would look out my window, here's what I would see, nothing. <laughs> nice idyllic Connecticut landscape, things like this. Now I have this little windowed office. People can actually see me work for the first time in 15 years. It's horrible. I have to look, I have to look busy all day long. <laughs> but when you walk out the door, you're in a sea of ideas. That for a company that's as old as we are and as big as we are, the need to be constantly paranoid and constantly on edge is so, so important. And I think that's what's really behind. You know, we want to be where innovation is happening. We want to see it early. But I think, just the biggest lesson for everybody here, because I know how much you guys care about the institution, is you've got to be willing. You, you, you've got, this is a moment in time where only the people that are willing to invest are going to be those institutions that are going to be successful over 5 or 10 or 15 years. And if you lose a beat in healthcare, you lose it for a long time. Thank you. So um, maybe go to another topic, which is technology, which you both are uh, very familiar with. Um, you know, we all read a lot and, and hear a lot about how the increased use of technology and advancements uh, continue to play a, an important role. Maybe, Lori, again, from the standpoint of cancer and Dana-Farber, you could give some sense of how things have changed because of the technology out there today in the work that we do? Well, I think in general, technological um, progress is an essential part of innovation, right? Because it enlarges the scope of what is possible. And you know, if you're a scientist, you know that 90% of your experiments are gonna fail. You're gonna be taking a lot of risks. And anything that will make you better able to predict those risks is gonna be of huge value. And that's essentially what technology can do because it provides you with enormous amounts of information. It also provides you with the ability to do very sophisticated molecular imaging, analyze enormous amounts of data, and then apply that to a given patient. So, you know, when, when a patient goes to an oncologist, goes to his general internist and says, well, I, I'm, I'm feeling a lump, the internist will say, well, I'm going to send you to the oncologist. And the oncologist looks at it and says, well, I'm going to send you, you know, to get a biopsy of the tumor, um, if that's what it is. And now, nowadays, I mean, that would have been the end of it 10, 15 years ago. You'd have standard chemotherapy, radiation therapy, that's the end. But now, that piece of tumor, that biopsy, goes to a team. It goes to the precision medicine team. And they sequence the tumor. And thanks to human genome sequencing, right? Thanks to the fact that we have the sequence of the human genome, and we can compare it to the sequence of the tumor. So that has enabled us to say, OK, now we know that it's this particular mutation that is driving your tumor. So that's the precision medicine team. And they send a report back to the oncologist and says, look, we have done all this wonderful technology on this tumor, and we know what the driver mutation is. And we recommend that your patient goes on this drug, if a drug exists that happens to target that mutation, or if no drug is available, here are the following clinical trials. And how do they find out about all those clinical trials? Because there's a huge database of all those clinical trials. And they can find the right clinical trial for the right patient. So you take very sophisticated technology 
and data analytics, and you translate it back to a, uh, to a patient right at the bedside, and you say, listen, you should be on Zalcori because you are one of those rare patients with lung cancer who has a mutation in this particular gene, the ALK kinase gene. And if we put you on that drug, you're going to have a remarkable response. So it, we've had remarkable leaps in the last decade between not only genome sequencing and, and sophisticated data analytics, but there have been a lot of other wonderful technologies that have come up that we've been able to use, a technology called CRISPR, which probably will win a Nobel Prize in the next few years, which enables you to selectively delete any specific gene in a cell so you can figure out what the function of that gene is. It sounds complicated, and it is complicated, but it's amazingly powerful. And to, to your point, you know, we now have a GE cyclotron in South Boston, and that is enabling us to do the kind of sophisticated molecular imaging in cancer that we could not do before. So how do you know which patients are going to respond to a drug? Well, you can develop these very sophisticated probes that you can use in imaging, and they can track the cancer. And, you know, I think we're the only, I think this is the only cyclotron in Boston that's exclusively dedicated to cancer research. Because how do you figure out what drugs a patient should be on and what combination of drugs a patient should be on? You want to get all that information as early as you can before you choose a clinical trial or a particular set of drugs for that patient. So, you know, and that, that can take days instead of months. It shortens the time when a physician can make the decision, this is what this patient needs to be on. So technology has been remarkable for cancer, absolutely remarkable. And now I, I've just learned that we have Lucy the robot. I don't know if you saw the, the piece in the Globe, I think it was today or yesterday. Lucy the robot goes around and distributes drugs to patients. So it saves the time of the staff from having to walk down the corridors and everything else, because Lucy goes chugging down the corner, cor corridors, finds the patient, drops off the, the medicine, and then turns around and goes somewhere else. And um, Lucy cost $150,000. I think it was probably well worth it. Uh, it's probably just the beginning of robotic medicine. So. Great. Jeff, how do you deep, see Deep pipelines, uh, Josh, of technology, again, I, I would say of all the businesses in GE, there's probably more good ideas in our healthcare business than any other, so deep pipeline. What I might speak to is just the way that, you know, our, our job is really both to invent, but frequently what we also try to do in industry is commercialize uh, technologies that come out of s startup companies or labs, places like Dana-Farber, Dana right? So. I'd say kind of in, in radiology, the, the modern diagnostic imaging business couldn't have existed without uh, really dozens of collaborations with great radiologists that worked on protocols and applications and things like that. So this is, you know, we've always tried to run the company as very much of an open architecture company. And I think the uh, ability to collaborate with clinicians is really uh, a big part of how technology comes to market. Our job is to get the cost right, to get the quality up, and things that we can do to make sure we can sell it around the world and, and spread it. Two, two places I would talk to, because I think they're quite important to Lori and, and Dana Farber. You know, one, the cyclotron. You know, basically, the industry for diagnostic markers, I think, should be much more robust than what we've seen the last. You know, for instance, the basic FDG marker that's used in PET scanning is like 25 years old. There should be dozens of markers, and, 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 and though in that regard, it, they actually should be done here. And people like GE, we should be in the FDA approval business, the service business, the distribution business, but that should be an open architecture technology in terms of how you really can get, uh, uh, I would say, a broader array of diagnostic markers in the industry. It's a classic one. The other one is, I think, in the area of cell therapy, you know, we've, we've got a venture arm, and we've, we, in our research labs, have built kind of a series of three pieces of equipment that can do the, you know, blood purification, the separation, and the ability to kind of stand up a service model in a town like Boston that can really facilitate around at Dana-Farber the ability to do cell therapy procedures at, at some scale level with the right quality and cost. Those are 
I would say, open architecture between GE innovation and collaborator innovation. And I think that's the way technology actually has taken place, um, you know, over the, you know, look, I mean, the crime of, about the NIH is it's actually one of the few government programs that's actually worked, you know? <laughs> the fact that it's being cut is really quite unfortunate because I think you can point to really hundreds of innovations that have taken place where really the NIH was a similar part. Now, industry has to step in and do some of those, but those are just two examples inside GE of places where we're working with, you know, really cancer leaders like Dana-Farber to be successful. And if you had to guess, if you think about, say, over the last five to 10 years, just the rate of growth in technology, do you think over the next five to 10 years it's a similar rate, an increasing rate, or a decreasing rate in just the change that's gonna come from technology? In terms of the pace of change? Yeah, the advancements. Like oh, look, I think it's, so, you know, you go in different industries at different cycles, but I think the amount of technical disruption, whether it's in material science, biology, uh, uh, you know, uh, quantitative sciences, is exploding and, and will continue to, um, I think, grow at a very rapid, a very rapid pace. I think it's exponential yeah. in biomedical research, absolutely exponential. If you look at the last few years, um, already CRISPR, which was only discovered a couple years ago, has revolutionized the way many people are doing science. And that's just the first of many. So we're looking, I think, at, a, at, a, at an exponential curve here. Great. So why don't we move on to um, uh, the issue of big data, which is discussed a lot. and. I, for one, I'm never sure I understand what it means. Um, but maybe, Laura, you could talk a little bit about um, you know, what that means at Dana-Farber and in cancer research, um, you know, how, how, what we're doing with all that data, how we're analyzing it, and, and how that's hopefully going to you know, eventually um, have a positive effect on our patients and patients all over the world. You know, this reminds me of a lot of the conversations we had um, at the Blue Ribbon panel over the summer. Um, when we were helping the vice president come up with a number of key themes that we should pursue, that cancer should pursue to make 10 years of progress in five years. And a lot of that conversation was around um, big data analytics because it's pretty easy to sequence something. We've got a lot of machines that can sequence. It is interpreting the data that is the difficult part. Um, it is very, very complicated, and without big data analytics, you know, we would be nowhere. I mean, now thousands of patients want to have their tumor sequenced, and all that information has to be analyzed by computational biologists who, at the Dana Farber, work extremely closely with the basic scientists that are doing biology research. And now we have a whole new area that we need to do big data analytics on, and that's the immune system. So if you think about it, these new drugs that have come out that are called checkpoint blockers that activate the immune system, they have been remarkable in a certain percentage of patients with a certain number of tumors. So in melanoma, you know, we've seen stage four metastatic melanoma patients get one of these drugs, and they're in remission. And Steve Hody, you know, has led the way here at the Dana-Farber in those clinical trials. But about 60% of patients don't respond. And we don't understand why that is. We do not understand how can we predict, to Jeff's point, how much can we predict? How can we develop more biomarkers, more more signal posts of flags that tell us this patient's going to respond to this therapy, but this patient isn't, so don't waste time by putting this patient on this therapy. That's going to require to do for the immune system what we've already been doing for the tumor itself, which is to analyze everything about it. What's different about the immune system in a patient who responds to one of these drugs compared to a patient that doesn't respond? And how come diseases like cancers like melanoma, lung, head and neck cancer, kidney cancer, bladder cancer, Hodgkin's lymphoma, how come they respond to these amazing drugs, these transformative drugs, but 
pancreatic cancer and prostate cancer and ovarian cancer, they don't respond. This is going to require an enormous amount of manipulation of data. And without data analytics, we would be nowhere. It also requires sharing data across institutions. And I think we're going to perhaps touch on how important collaboration is in a minute. But you're talking about terabytes of data. And we have to reduce those terabytes of data to a clinically actionable decision for a patient. Um, we've set up a new collaboration with several institutions, with, the, um, with Intel, with the Oregon Health and Science University, uh, with the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research. And so we can now um, securely share that information among these institutions. Because there's always the issue of, uh, obviously, very important issue of pa patient privacy and patient confidentiality. So the analytics platform that's in place at these institutions and our institution allows us to share that data so that together we can make progress more quickly than we can do it by ourselves. Jeff, is this affecting your business you a know, lot? So we've, we've, we've invested uh, big time in, uh, uh, across GE and the platforms of big data. So, you know, we do, um, you know, if you look today and you fly from Boston to Chicago, uh, we can uh, talk about the wear of the blade, the optimal fuel performance, what the emission should be. If you overhaul the engine, we know what needs to be fixed before the plane lands. And these are all problems of, you know, gathering data and assessing it the right way. Uh, I would just add to what Lori said, if you're, you know, because, you know, one of, the, one of our points of entry to a hospital is radiology. You know, a CT scanner, a modern CT scanner, an MR scanner, maybe even the best radiologist out of the box is going to be able to use 10% of the data that the uh, instrument is throwing off. It's just the power of computing is so vast. So the goal is to pick up a lot of the insight post-processing. So with cloud technology, you can now do that at a very low cost point. And an institution like Dana-Farber, you can compare yourself to yourselves or to others. And I think you can start spotting uh, uh, patterns of disease or patterns of imaging, which is going to uh, help you do you know, just better diagnostics faster. And I, I think the way to think about it, uh, Josh, you made the point earlier that it's today's biggest buzzword is big data and things like that. I always think about it in terms of outcomes. What problem are you trying to solve? So uh, other institutions, let's say, that are focused on cancer, they're using big data to try to get to say, OK, how do we do a better job of diagnosing a cancer patient and putting them on, on the right protocol day one? That's a big data problem. That'll be solved by doing, you know, comparing thousands of other similar cases, getting the insight from the physicians. That is. You know, it's a great outcome for patients. It's lower cost for the system. Those are the problems that are now possible because of cloud technology, because of data technology, and what and what can happen. And again, I could go to drug discovery or efficiencies down the road. So I think, I think a place like uh, Dana Farber, this has got to be one of your future focal points because I think it's going to be part of what leadership is all about in the future. Great. So I think um, the last area before we open to questions is collaboration, which, Laurie, you mentioned. Uh, obviously, uh, Laurie, you spent a lot of your career here and then went to New York and are now are returning. Um, and so you have the perspective uh, of the two cities and also the perspective of Dana-Farber. Um, and then, obviously, Jeff, you know, we talked a little bit about the Boston move, uh, but really curious as to your thoughts on you know, all the different things that are going on in Boston and how you see that affecting um, you know, collaboration uh, for GE, but I don't know, maybe, Laura, you could start? So I like to say that my middle name is collaboration <laughs> because, you know, the, we're in an era now of team science. I mean, science is a team sport now. <coughs> no one laboratory can do everything to solve a certain problem. You need to have your basic biologist. You need your translational researcher. You need your computational biologist to analyze the data. You need pathology and radiology. And so the internal collaboration at the Dana-Farber is one of the reasons why I wanted to come back here, because it is really pretty seamless. 
And I think it's part, partly because we have such a, such a unique balance of researchers to physician clinicians. And having that be an equal balance is, it doesn't exist anywhere else in any other cancer center, but it makes it possible for our environment to be a completely seamless one from the scientist working in his or her laboratory and the clinician at the bedside. And this is, you know, this is not a one-way process. This is actually a circle. So the basic scientist comes up with a discovery and tells his colleague about it, tells his colleague who's a translational researcher about it. That basic scientist works with our Belfer facility and our experimental, therape our experimental therapeutics facility to start testing it in animal models. That's the preclinical stage. And then it segues to the clinical researcher who's going to say, all right, well, let's take it to the next step. And let's see if this is going to, going to, going to be possible in humans. Right? So this is all collaboration. And if this process does not work seamlessly, then a lot of time is going to be wasted. And Dana-Farber is pretty unique in how well that process works here. We're also, you know, we're, we're the Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center. That is seven institutions working together. Four hospitals, Dana-Farber, Harvard Medical School, Harvard School of Public Health. We share a cancer grant, a comprehensive cancer grant. It's the biggest ca comprehensive cancer grant in the country. We have like 1,100 faculty. And we need to take advantage of everybody's talent, right? I mean, what are we, I always say, what are we doing this for? What are we working so hard for day and night if it isn't to find a cure for cancer? That's, that's what's in our hearts. And if we can do that best by collaborating with whoever we need to collaborate with to move this forward faster, then we, we're going to do it. And, and, and the vice president was very eloquent on that point. I mean, he said, you know what? You got to share. Everybody has to share. And you know, I was proud to be there at the panel because Dana-Farber is an institute that shares. It really does. Not only internally, but externally as well. And that extends, I think, to our collaborations with the private sector. To me, the marriage between the private sector and academia is a marriage made in heaven for our patients. Because you know, what academic institutions do best is basic discovery. And you know, Bill Kalin is a great example of that. Basic science, he asked a very basic question. He said, well, how do cells sense oxygen? Right, very basic question. And he spent years pursuing that. And it turned out he found the answer. He got the Lasker Award for finding that answer. And now that discovery has led to new drugs that are now in the clinic for patients with cancer. So we need basic discovery, we need translational research, and we need clinical care. Because oftentimes I found that it is the observant physician at the bedside that notices something about a patient that's unusual and says, you know, I wonder why patients with cancer have a lower risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. How curious is that, right? If we understood that, wouldn't we know more about both Alzheimer's disease and cancer? And it's the clinicians that notice that, and they, they, they say that to a basic science. They say, well, you know, how, why would this make sense? And now you're stimulated. So you're going from bench to bedside and bedside back to bench. And to me, you got to do that. And, and I'm always reminded, actually, of a quote. I think it was President Truman. It might have been Winston Churchill. But I forget who said it, but they said, you know, it's amazing how much you can get done if you don't care who gets the credit for it. So that's my answer. Great. Elaborate. And Je it's Jeff, much is, better than company in addition conditions. to the comments you've already made about coming to Boston, I'm just curious, obviously, you know, we in Boston think about a lot of, you know, great people, a lot of great institutions, universities, uh, institu you know, other kinds of, of research institutions around here. How does that, will that affect GE in some ways? Are there ways that you feel like you'll be able to collaborate? Yeah, you know, Judge, I, again, I, I would make a quick comment just to agree with everything <coughs> Lori said. I think people in the, in the healthcare industry, you know, we've all built our companies by collaborating with physicians, with hospitals. So this is a long-standing practice in this industry. 
and one that we can always get better at by, wor by working together. So I, I think that th this is, collaboration is key in healthcare. I, I think your broader point on Boston, look, one of our hypotheses in moving here was that this was a, what I would say, you know, because you know, I, I travel the world extensively and things like that. In my mind, this was kind of a wasted ecosystem. You know, if, if you look at Silicon Valley, uh, Sand Hill Road, everything that's happened around Stanford and things like that, there's no reason why all of that couldn't be in some way, shape, or form here. And I think it exists in pockets, but certainly when it comes to life sciences, healthcare, a, a series of things around advanced manufacturing, and I could go down a list, uh, the goal, the vision for this city should be not to let so much of it escape and try to build a better ecosystem. I think GE can be part of that. I think you've got institutions here that are part of that. But uh, there's so much talent in this town. There's so many great schools. There's so many great talented researchers. Too much of it gets away. So I, I think, um, you know, one of the, in the back of my mind, I started my career in G's plastics business. And I remember going to California in the early 80s. And all of the housings of computers were made in our plastics. So, you know, I, I got to meet Stephen Jobs before he was Stephen Jobs, when he was just making big, clunky uh, computers. And, you know, Hewlett Packard was a centrifugal force to that part of the country in the early days. And I think, you know, we kind of thought that maybe there was a chance to be first in by coming to a place like Boston, just because the ecosystem, in my opinion, hasn't been formed here the way I've seen it in other parts of the world. Great. So I, I think that remains. I would be disappointed if GE can't add to that. And I think the town, people in this room should be disappointed if that's not where Boston is. You know, every, I, I'll sit down with, a, with a, a venture in Silicon Valley that maybe we've taken an equity stake in, and they're all these 32-year-old you know, men and women and just, I introduce myself, tell me something about yourself. They all went to MIT or Harvard or <laughs> went to school here, and then they all move out there, right? And so, I don't know, the weather here, I, we haven't been through our first winter yet, but I, I don't think the weather's, <laughs> I don't know, the weather's not so bad, but you know, it's, so anyway, I think that's what collaboration can be. Great, yeah. thank you. So I did want to thank Lori and Jeff for a great conversation. Jeff also, we have lots of folks here from Boston and folks from all over the country, but on behalf of all the Bostonians, we want to welcome you and GE here. We're thrilled to have you, and I think it's uh, incredibly really, important. Really fantastic to be here. Well, that's great. Well, thank yeah. you so much for coming. Great, thanks. <laughs>